All right, destructors. So this is a time cast, a screencast rather, using the time class for destructors. So when this program executes, we obviously construct a time object here. And when execution leaves the scope of a block, in this case it's main, but it's any block, it could be a method, it could be a for loop, it could be an if statement. The runtime environment automatically executes a method called a destructor. And you know, what that does is it cleans up after the object. It may deallocate any memory. It may close files, things of that nature. It really depends on what the object is. And this happens automatically. There is a default implementation of a destructor. And for classes involving integers, the simple types, integers, doubles, and with class objects that have a destructor, such as the string class, this default implementation works fine. When we start talking about self-referential classes, we'll see that we will need to implement our own destructor. What I want to do in this screencast is show you how destructors work, even though we don't have to implement one. Just so you understand that this mechanism is happening. So destructors, like constructors, have names similar to the class. So here we have a default constructor. It is called time. And to declare a destructor, not deconstructor, that's postmodernism. This is C++. It's a destructor. We use the tilde and then the name of the class, and it takes no arguments. You can put this anywhere. I tend to put it at the bottom. You could put it after the constructors if you wanted to, but this is a destructor. Maybe you could put it at the end of your constructors. It's really up to you. So that is the declaration of a destructor. Now when we talk about the implementation, I usually make it the last. So we start with the class name and tilde time is the name of the destructor, and then we have the body. Now there's nothing this destructor needs to do, so I'm simply going to put an output statement here. And this will let us see when the destructor actually executes. Now in my main function, here I am, and if I run this, then I see the output statement from destructing or from the execution of the destructor. It's not really clear when this is happening though. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write starting and then I will say finished constructing and now I will say finished executing. And I'll just throw in an output statement here so we'll see what's going on. So what we're going to see is we will see the starting message printed. Then we will actually construct the object T1 then we'll see the message finished constructing, then we'll see the output of T1, then we will see finished executing, and then what we'll see is we'll see the message that we get from the destructor. So the destructor is actually executing just before we finish executing the return zero. So the main function is still running, but we've executed all of the statements, and that's when all the objects will be destructed. And in fact, for every time object we've declared in main, we will see a destruction message. So let's run that and I'll come back and do that. So here's a dot out. You can see that we saw finished executing and then we saw destructing. If I declare another time object in here and I'll just use the default value, then now I'm going to see two destructing messages. So this is to help you understand 
how destructors work. Now in this case, again, just to emphasize, we don't need to implement one of these. I just did it to illustrate how destructors work for classes and objects.